Hello everyone, this is our second panel at the Tweet Summit 2020. And yes, it has been an extraordinary year so far. The pandemic had huge effect on how we surf through personal lives as well as work environment. And our objective in this panel today is to discuss how we all leveraged during these changes and how investor relationship professionals can further capitalize on the current disruptive environment. And with that, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our panelists. We have Anami Korayim, Institutional Investors, EMEA Sales Strategic Partnership and Product Development Director. We have Mohsin Memon, Fund Manager at Schroders, and Thomas Larson, Head of Investor Relations at AstraZeneca. We'll take a few minutes for each panelist to please briefly introduce themselves. Anami. Thank you very much, Sarah, um, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me um, to join this panel, which is an important, obviously, discussion point, and um, jo joining those fantastic panelists as well. Um, I'm a director at Institutional Investor Research, which is a division within Institutional Investor and part of Euro Money PLC. Um, I look after, as you mentioned, the corporate product, which is um, the executive product for Europe and uh, EMEA, which focuses uh, on engaging with buy side and sell side. Uh, um, really ultimately to support corporate IR and to help them monitor their own progress, identify you know, their strengths and, and opportunities within their IR outreach and um, allow for much better resource allocation and, and planning. Um, and I've been at the company nearly six years and before in business information as well. Thank you. Thank you, Anami. And Mohsin? Hello, my name is Mohsen Memon. I am a fund manager at Schroders. I co-manage the Emerging European product. Um, I've been looking at the region <clears throat> for the last 10 years um, and we've been invested in Turkey uh, for long before I joined the firm. Um, but I, as I said, I co-manage the product uh, and we've been looking at the region for the last 10 years. Perfect. And Thomas? Thank you and thanks for inviting me to the, uh, to the meeting today and to the conference. I'm Thomas Kuzglas and I'm Head of Investor Relations at AstraZeneca. It's a UK company, uh, half uh, UK and half uh, Swedish. I've been here since uh, 2014. And before that, I worked uh, almost 10 years at the Swiss company Roche as Head of Investor Relations in uh, North America. And before that, I was in Investor Relations both in Denmark. I am from Denmark, uh, both in Denmark and in the US for a Danish company called Novo Science, a biotech company. My background is in finance before going into investor relations, where I did a traineeship at Novo Nordisk, the Danish uh, pharma company. So altogether about 20 years in investor relations, and I really, really like it. Great. Thank you again for everyone joining. Well, the world has dramatically changed and online became the king and health has become the new wealth, right? <laughs> Looking at the financial markets, I just want to throw out a few fun facts. The market cap of Amazon and Google now has surpassed the market cap of China in the MSCI equity index. And similarly, we can look at Apple higher than UK and Microsoft larger than Canada. And all of us during this time have experienced the increased volatility and decreased visibility. I, I know from myself that I've been at home since mid-March. I had to upsize my internet package at least three times during the time. And I had four different Zoom meetings going under the same roof simultaneously. And I had the privilege of my five-year-old son joining my global conferences at the firm I work for. So with that, I would like to hear, please, your stories. How you and your teams have managed to keep up in these volatile times? And how did you respond to all these changes? Perhaps some of the advantages, some of the challenges you would like to share with us, please. Mosse, would you like to kick off? Sure. Um, I mean, as you say, it's a very weird. It's been a very weird time for the last uh, sort of nine months or so, um, and we've all sort of learned to work from home. Um, <clears throat> I'll say some of the benefits first. Um, I have uh, two very young children. Um, and I got to spend a lot of time with them, uh, which I thought uh, was not going to be possible. So I have got a one-year daughter, old daughter, and I saw her grow up, uh, which was very, very nice. Um, so that was the positive bit. 
I guess the negative bit is, you know, struggling with um, doing everything yourself. Um, like you said, everyone's done it. Um, being a teacher, being a cleaner, uh, working at the same time. Um, so that was a challenge. Um, but we, we got into the rhythm um, and I guess um, technology has helped quite a lot. Um, fortunately for me, uh, we started working from home um, once a day um, at the mid from, from mid last year, uh, which means we are quite set up um, to work from home. Um, so we had all the sort of equipment and everything, everything set up. Um, so it was quite s smooth transition to working from home. Um, how we cope with it is, um, I guess, you know, working from home, you miss the interaction with your team. Um, so initially we set up quite a few uh, meetings to begin with. Um, you find that when you start working from home, all of a sudden um, you don't have that many meetings. When you're in the office, you always had a meeting, 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 meeting. But when you're at home, all of a sudden you can do without all the meetings. Um, but we set up uh, our group meetings, we um, touch points of every day, every week, and gradually it just became um, very natural. So rather than waiting for these meetings, we just, you know, try to call each other more and speak to each other more. Um, and yeah, I think I think it's it's now it's, it's working quite smoothly uh, from that point of view. Um, but yeah, so I think going forward, how, how is it going to impact? I think um, our work life has somewhat changed. Um, so um, we will our teams are, or management teams are encouraging, encouraging us to work from home more. Um, but obviously we do want to meet, go to the office and meet each other and see each other. So hopefully we'll get to work maybe twice a day, twice a week from home and then go into the office. So it'd be, it'd be, a, it'd be a good balance. Wonderful, thank you. We are all finding the balance. Thomas, would you like to continue? Sure. So uh, my uh, my examples are a bit boring actually because it, it didn't change so much for us. And uh, AstraZeneca, as I said in, in my introduction, is a UK based, but it's both UK and the Swedish company. We have a very large presence in the US. We have a very large presence in emerging markets in the general. So as a starting point, the company is very dispersed. We don't really have a physical headquarters. So we were already using video conferencing a lot because our executives are everywhere and nowhere. They're not always in the same spot. So, so we were dispersed already. And I think that actually equipped us really well to deal with this crisis. So not a big change. Uh, in terms of working from home, not working from home. So I'm very lucky, or maybe I planned it like that, but I have less than 10 minutes to work. So I live very close to the office, right? So I'm in the office now. I'm in the office most days. Uh, some of my colleagues are here as well. We just keep a good distance and uh, there's, there's just no one here. So I've been using the office a lot, uh, you know, still working from home. If, if I wanted, uh, you know, going to, to the office most days, I get fast internet, the printer and so on. So not a big change for us. I think for some team members in the IR team, there is more homework, but we always had the flexibility to work from home if, if we wanted to. And if you could agree that with your manager. So, AstraZeneca already set up quite, let's say, virtual to start with. So that helped. I think that the bigger change for us has been that we don't travel, right? So when I um, when I completed the full year roadshow after full year 2019 results, that was in February. I flew to Canada in, in mid-February and I came back from New York uh, end of uh, February. And that was my last big trip. And that is the bigger change for me is that that, that uh, travel time can now be used for something else. So we've invested a lot of that time into improving our systems. Our CM system, where we keep track of all our investor and analyst interactions, has been greatly upgraded. We have, um, we have then offered a lot of meetings to uh, the buy side, to investors through Zoom and other means. So we have tried to convert that travel time to being some active time, either investing in our team and our infrastructure or uh, offering meetings to investors we would probably not have offered meetings to in the past. So we're trying to convert, let's say, the downside into an upside. And I think that that travel piece is probably the biggest change on our side. And I very much agree uh, with, with Mosin about this, this kind of flexible or hybrid approach going forward. I think that's where we're also ending up as a company in AstraZeneca, that we allow people to work from home some days and other days uh, they're coming in. And that means that the offices, as they are known today, they will have to change. So I think that's the bigger change is the lack of traveling. But as I said earlier, we were already quite dispersed as a company. So I think the way we interact and work together did not change too much. 
That is true. Travel time can be used elsewhere. I, I really uh, do mimic that. Uh, Anami, you want to continue? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I think um, I I was counting my blessings every every day, um, realizing that I have older children, so I didn't uh, uh, need to sort of engage and um, uh, with, with with younger ones and trying to keep them away from uh, while I'm on on conference calls and and business calls. So um, I I very much sympath empathize with you, uh, Mohsen, for for having uh, little ones. Uh, but you know, like like he said, it, I think it's it's great to be so close uh, with family. For me, it wasn't actually that different because I'm mostly home based. Um, so I work mostly from home, which is which is great uh, for for me. Um, but I think for for our business, we've actually been impacted quite significantly. Um, and I speak now from the perspective of Euro Money PLC. Um, a lot of the business that, that Euro Money owns is actually um, based and, and seeded into physical conferences and events. So we were actually hit quite hard um, as a result of that and uh, had to come, or well, management at least, had to have a very rapid response strategy uh, because we were running weekly physical um, events globally. Um, so that was very hard. But um, very quickly, the team was put into steering committees and uh, they responded really uh, quite uh, significantly um, in an organized and structured fashion, which was actually fantastic. And it was almost like a, a digital war uh, situation or room environment where the uh, MO was very much focused on we needed to fail fast and we needed to understand what kind of platforms uh, we had to access to um, transition seamlessly into this virtual environment um, without uh, interrupting um, our engagement with our customers and partners. And I think that was quite critical. And with that, um, what was interesting is because everybody moved into a home office, um, we saw obviously a shift in behavior, a shift in interest, a shift in preferences, um, you know, how information was consumed and accessed. And uh, and that is something that we also ne needed to learn very quickly. Um, so we had to um, adopt uh, and accelerate technology um, actually very quickly into our processes, um, fundamentally to track and monitor customer and con consumer preferences, if you like, and to identify um, where the changes are and how we can actually respond to those changes. And within that, we've also identified um, new potential um, uh, customer relationships, which was you know, very exciting. So we had much more people um, joining our virtual events than we have had obviously in the past because of the you know breaking down the barrier of time and space. So we were um, through the increase um, in content and the quality of our content and the quality Quality of our communication, which became a lot more targeted, understanding a lot more about our users and and um, and how they're wanting to uh, experience a digital conference, uh, we were able to actually um, uh, increase the outreach, and that was, I think, a fantastic side effect um, of of this whole process. But uh, it required us to really sort of reimagine the whole. Um, you know, customer experience, if 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 you like, and be um, very agile and creative um, uh, with with our um, platforms, with our engagements, um, you know, pollings that we did regularly, and stay really close to our um, customers and con consumers. And I think for the future, um, you know, this this will stay. I mean, being being in a virtual space, um, organizing virtual uh, events will stay. But we are looking to actually create a hybrid um, uh, hybrid conferencing. Uh, model where um, we can actually have physical events and, um, you know, maintaining, of course, all the social distancing requirements, having rapid testing facilities, you know, creating bubbles where people, you know, I identified as, as those kind of bubbles and they stick to it. Thank you, Amani. I uh, agree uh, with what you said and I can add to that at Bank of America Securities, we had excellent participation, record participation to all of our conferences this year, the flagship ones as well as more regional ones. So without the travel hassle and the time differential, definitely that does help. My next question uh, to everyone will be on the best practices, please. Thomas, if, if uh, you don't mind, I would like to start with you. And first and foremost, before we start on that, I would like to extend big congratulations for winning the outstanding IRO and the best team at the IR Society Annual uh, Best Practice Awards. So well done, great job. Thank you. And you do work for a 
best-in-class growth company with a robust pipeline portfolio, but more importantly, in a sector that has a lot of focus these days, you know, with the health and the vaccine angle, obviously. So as a seasoned IRO, what are some of those best practices that you and your team had adopted during this time, please? Yeah, thanks very much. And thanks also for the recognition we received from the, from the market. We really appreciate it. And actually this year, we appreciate it even more than past years because it has been a little bit difficult for everyone, right? But I think in, in terms of best practices, I mean, so, so my answer will be a little bit more related to COVID, but also maybe in uh, general. But I started off saying that we invested some time in our infrastructure. We kind of converted the, let's say, lack of travel time into investing in our team and investing in the infrastructure, all the systems that are supporting us. So one best practice I would I would highlight is that this is this is a great opportunity to sort out your customer relationship management system. Really organize yourself around your contacts. I mean the, the IR job is a relationship job. And keeping track of your relationships, keeping track of your meetings, keeping track of what you're saying to people is really important. And I think that in a virtual world even more than in a physical world. So, so invest time and effort in upgrading, streamlining, optimizing your CM system, making it, making it more of an outreach tool as well. We use it now to contact investors globally. So for instance, after each quarterly result, uh, we, um, we, we have essentially split the world. So we are eight people in the IR team. I would say it's five, six people that are doing active outreach. And, and those people uh, are now allocated to different regions. And we typically do it based on our language ability. So we are, we are very uh, pleased to have a team that is quite diverse. So we have, I would say, genes from Sweden, Denmark, Nigeria, Luxembourg, uh, UK, Wales, uh, from many parts of the world. And we speak many different languages. So based on that and based on that diversity, we are trying to then allocate countries and regions to each team member. And they are then responsible for reaching out very actively after each quarterly result and ask people, do you want to have a meeting? And we're using the CRM system now to do that. We've organized it very differently so we can target and reach out to investors all around the world. So th this is one of the big benefits, right, of virtual is that you can essentially have a, a, a day where you can speak with Asia in the morning, uh, you know, Europe uh, uh, around noon and US in the evening. And I think this is what we're trying to then capitalize on, but you need somehow a starting point. And, and our recommendation is really to think about your CM system being such a great starting point. Then um, also, for instance, all these virtual conferences that have taken place now, right? That we, we have an, a unique opportunity to think outside the box. We would normally maybe go just the IR team and we would maybe have to travel or take the train to London. We're based in Cambridge, north of London. Um, or, and we would bring an executive sometimes, but now we can offer three executives at a conference, right? Because we can do a European based executive in the morning. Maybe we do a US one in the afternoon. Maybe we do another US one, right? So, so uh, think about the conference as not being one flow of, of meetings, but it can be some IR meetings with one executive, another executive, depending on time zones and depending on availability. It's a lot easier for us to get management time because it's an hour commitment of 45 minutes or one and a half hour. So you can really tailor make it now. And that was very, uh, this is very different to, to the past, right? So I, I have this thought that many of our executives, they don't want to go back to traveling. They want to go back and continue what we're doing now because it's just more efficient for them. So think about conferences as being an, an opportunity to really do things differently. The same with roadshows, right? We have done now, essentially two, well, one and a two uh, global roadshows. And we have again organized it so that we meet Asian investors in the morning. We're based in the UK, right? So we are kind of one hour uh, behind Central Europe. So we can meet Asia in the morning. Uh, so we have um, you know, multiple teams and multiple tracks doing that. We can run three or four tracks in parallel, different executives, different IR people. Then uh, we meet European investors uh, later that morning. We start then in the afternoon meeting U.S. investors while still meeting European investors. Then at night we can do U.S. And then we could even squeeze in a, a time at midnight with Asia Pacific, right? We, of course, don't do this four days in a row or five days in a row. We alternate the IR people so you don't get too tired. But you have a lot of opportunity to meet with people in a very different manner. The only thing we have found, though, is that you also then need to pick brokers and your partners differently. 
because you need to allocate a full region to a broker because otherwise there'll be overlaps. You, you, you cannot say, Bank of America, uh, can you go and get some meetings in you know, Kansas City in the US? It doesn't work like that in a virtual world, right? So I think you need to be very mindful about how you interact with brokers and, and how you have people you know, help you. It's probably going to be by region. So you say, well, you can do Asia, you can do Europe, you can do US, and then they find out to squeeze in people here and there. So maybe that's another best, best practice. And then we have done something very unique, which I think is a little bit special. We know that many people are working from home, right? We know that, that life is not as exciting as it used to be. So on a couple of occasions this year, we had a sell-side lunch uh, with the management team after our half-year results in uh, July. And we also recently, this week actually, had an event with our chairman. And for these events, we had asked the participants to send uh, us their addresses. And then we actually organized catering to their homes. So for the lunch, we would send them a um, kind of a traditional English, you know, you know tea um, uh, with small, you know, sandwiches and, and, and biscuits and so on. So very personalized. And they would have that delivered on the day. So we would sit there on Zoom, but we would actually eat together because we would eat the same food. And uh, recently, we, when we did the event with the chairman earlier this week, we had also biscuits and small, small cakes made with our logo on. So very personalized. We have not done this more than these two uh, occasions, but it just adds a little bit more. It, it creates like a memory in the, in the minds of the investors. It, it doesn't cost too much, but it's a very nice way to think that, you know, people are sitting at home, it's a bit boring. How can we, you know, pip up their lives a little bit? So I would say these are probably three, four best practices that, that we can share uh, having lived through, uh, let's say, nine months or so of uh, COVID-19. That is wonderful, sending lunch to their homes and having the same food while talking. I have one follow-up question, Thomas, before yep. we move on to the next speaker, please. Uh, would you spend a few minutes uh, to discuss the quality of the meetings at those virtual conferences, meetings? Obviously, it's not in person, especially if it's a group call. Some people may be closing down their Zoom screens. Were you able to get the same feeling of that personal touch looking into their eyes? Or do you think some things were missing? Was it different when it's IR team only versus senior management? Thank you. That's a, that's a very, very important point. So what we have noticed is that many investors do actually not uh, run their camera, right? So they are just essentially attending a phone meeting. And I find that, um, I find that actually a bit rude. And I also find it um, uh, energy sapping. So it takes away energy from the people that are actually sharing and trying to do a meeting. So we always try to encourage people to share their videos, um, but it's not easy. And I, I can see geographical differences. I think American investors are more likely to share their screens. At least that's my kind of quick experience. Asian investors, the same. I think European investors have not been so good at it, and particularly also out of London, not so good at it. So I think you have to divide. There is that element that we all need to contribute to make it a great meeting. And I think sharing your screen um, and, and kind of showing what you're doing, it doesn't really hurt anyone, right? But it makes it a much better meeting. I, I did not see a big difference between IR only meetings and then meetings with, with management. I think that geographical difference was more what we observed. Um, it is, it is I, think, I think it's here to stay. I think some conferences we will not travel to in the future. I mean, we have been traveling sometimes to California for one conference one day and then, then flying back. I mean, from a time point of view, and also from an environmental and carbon dioxide point of view, it doesn't really make sense. So I think th this is here to stay, but I would, I would really, really encourage at least the IR people to always kind of do the right thing, which is show what, you know, how you should do it, which is, you know, being open and, and you know, sharing, and then try to really encourage investors to do the same. We are now telling people for roadshows and so on that it should be part of the requirement when we book a meeting that people are willing to share so that it becomes more fun. Because as I said earlier, it is energy sapping uh, if people are just like on a black screen and on their phone. So, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. This has been a challenge, but I think you can show a good example and then hopefully we can encourage people to do the same. 
On the one hand, it is understandable, but yes, uh, unfortunately, uh, we have seen more uh, screen shutdown examples in conferences, in one-on-one in -on -one meetings. Mohsen, I know you've been covering, as you said, emerging EM for many, many years, and everyone in the audience knows you really well. And I know you have attended also several virtual meetings and conferences throughout the year as well. Can you please walk us through what was your experience in the emerging world, similar to what Thomas explained in, on the DM side? How were the quality of the meetings, perhaps the frequency of the connections you had with the companies you're covering? What were some of the best practices you may have seen in different geographies that you can share with us? Thank you. I mean, I'll. Uh, second Thomas's point about sharing the screen. I think it's very important to share the screen. And second one is quite a difficult one is how you manage the mute button is uh, when people speak together. It's a, I find that a challenge. You see that in internal meetings as well. So I think maybe there needs to be a moderator who politely reminds people to once you've had your, had your say, please go on mute. Otherwise we can just hear you breathing. So you can't ask them to stop breathing, but you know, you can ask them to please go on the mute. Um, so I think, I think that's quite important. But another point that Thomas made was is about relationships. I think from an IR point of view, our uh, job is establishing relationships. And I think it sort of started from the MIFID, MIFID point of view is that that before a lot of our um, interactions with companies maybe used to go through brokers. Uh, but because of MIFID, I think that sort of thing changed and maybe there was a direct contact between investors, at, at least myself and the companies. Um, so we started meeting or sorry, speaking emailing far more frequently, um, mostly because, I mean, the region we covered, maybe the resource allocated to the region was, was lower. Um, so the, 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 you know, the relationship became stronger here. And I think COVID has sort of accelerated that, um, where now if we are not doing roadshows, if you're not doing meetings, then uh, in person, in conferences, then we just have to get on the phone or get on the email and try and organize that meeting um, 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 uh, online. Um, so so, so that, that's been, a, that's been a, a interesting and I think it's quite, quite important change. Um, the other one, again, I'll mention is that, you know, before maybe you should do roadshows or you should do conferences. I mean, I like conferences because they can be efficient, um, but I also like roadshows because a management sitting in, in a conference for eight hours and if you're the eighth person seeing them, you know, it's not fun for them and it's not fun for you. So you get you get very tired. And I think with in, in this post MIFID and post COVID world, I think that's changed the sense that, you know, you, you don't have to wait for the conference to come in. You know, you can you can organize a call as as Thomas said, you know, um any time. And it's a lot easier. Um maybe those that, that those barriers have been broken and the and the communication tools are better. So you get to meet the management or speak to the management when they haven't been tired after you know seven meetings so i think that's a positive change um and you know i'll, I'll say again one more thing is that on the relationship i think it's been easier uh, for companies that we've already known so you know in for example in in turkey you know i know a lot of the companies i know a lot of the irs know very well maybe it's easier to do a meeting then, but if we are meeting a new management team, a new company, then I think it might be better to meet them in person, see them in person to establish that relationship. So maybe it's a bit difficult when you're meeting a company for the first time, um, but an already established relationship is 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 is, is a lot easier. Um, and 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 the, and, the, and the last point I'll make is 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 again the, the one that Thomas make is is that you know before we you know in, on a conference or and and and, and, and roadshows we will meet executives, uh, but now we have an opportunity to actually meet someone in operations and get a different angle and understand the company much, much better. Uh, so I think in, in the post-COVID and post-MIFID world, I think that's been a sort of positive change is that it, our, our understanding of the company is, is a lot deeper because uh, we've, we've met a so wider range of management team or, or deeper management team. So, so that's been better. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's all from me. That's interesting. You're right. We were able to present with different uh, roles within the big corporates. Uh, I have one more question. Just want to make sure the transparency of the corporates, the investor relation teams, has that been changed in a COVID versus pre-COVID world uh, from your experience, Martin? Um, no, I don't think so. I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's been similar, but I mean, maybe, you know, it's, as I said, I think it's probably a, a bit fresher because, you know, you're not waiting for a conference to happen or you're not waiting for a roadshow to go on. So, you know, you can speak to management team a bit more frequently. Um, so you, you know, you get information, which is a, a bit more relevant. Um, but I think that the, the content and the quality of content has been, has been quite, quite, uh, consistent. Um, I mean, I, I, if I can add just one more thing on the IR front is, is, uh, some of the Turkish companies do this, this really well is that, you know, they've been 
with the new technology now putting meetings with management teams on their websites. Um, so sometimes, you know, if you if if the management team hasn't got time to do the meeting straight away, you can actually go online and they will have have these videos available online, which can be quite quite informative. So again, that's been been quite useful. Wonderful, thank you. And Amani, I know your team have a certain criteria to measure the industry relations team for best practices, you know, from an II hat. Can you share with, with us some of those met metrics, please? You know, what do you guys look at it as a criteria? But also with your other hat, obviously your parent company you mentioned, Euromoney, which is a listed entity, and they have an IR team. So you may have been able to ab observe some of the uh, rethinking of their strategy. Maybe you can share. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Seda. Um, I think uh, Thomas and uh, Mohsen already m mentioned quite um, a few valid points. Um, I think what, what I would like um, to add to that is that obviously the way companies have responded to COVID uh, based is based fundamentally on what kind of original resources uh, they had and where they're at in terms of also their their technology uh, journey, if you like, and how they have adopted um, digitization into their overall strategy. But I think when we look at best practices outside of um, uh, the pandemic, if you if you like, we always need to look at what what investors want and how they consume information and and what type of information they're looking for that can actually help them make informed investment decisions. And um, we have run, to your point, Sita, um, a number of different um, research uh, polls um, outside of the pandemic, but also um, during the pandemic. And one of the key things that actually leads investors to consider um, a p p potential um, exit out of a position is weak leadership and lack of transparency. And um, and these are things that are actually outside of the COVID. And I think they would have been heightened, obviously, during the pandemic, where, um, you know, business leaders were scrutinized um, uh, quite heavily. Uh, but, but I think when we look at um, what investors want and, and how they want to be engaged with, um, they've actually uh, shared with us three very key um, areas. One is basically real-time updates. So they want to understand and wanted to understand and continue to want to understand how COVID is actually impacting the business uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, so, so the second area um, that was important uh, is for um, corporates to actually communicate on how they're treating their employees and uh, their customers and their partners. So basically how um, companies are taking care of their wider stakeholder uh, consist constituency. And that, that is very critical because that obviously sits within the ESG metrics, um, specifically on the social um, component of ESG. And that has actually has uh, received heightened interest and heightened focus. Um, so I think this is, this is very, very important as part of the transparency and the communication um, with investors. Um, the other thing that investors have actually mentioned to us is that they they appreciate, of course, that um, business leaders don't have a crystal ball. That's clear. But they still need to understand, um, you know, the, your best estimate in terms of, you know, how this is impacting the company and what the future trajectory may look like. Um, and, and the other third element that they've actually um, increasingly mentioned is IR responsiveness. So it's very important that IR is readily um, available and accessible to respond to investor questions uh, and comments. And uh, and I think more importantly than actually responding is to anticipating their needs. So and and how do you anticipate needs is really by staying close to your investor community and um, engaging regularly with them, obtaining feedback on an ongoing basis, sending out little questionnaires um, about specific events or specific um, uh, releases that you have done. Um, and I think that's very important, but that's also, that goes outside of the COVID environment anyway. So this is real best practice IR and, and really, you know, part and parcel of the standard um, engagement. Um, and and Mohsen mentioned a, a very uh, important point. And again, this is, this falls out outside of the um, uh, pandemic, but it's very critical in terms of IR engagement. And, and this is the, the regulatory environment. The regulatory environment has changed quite significantly over the years, whether it is um, through MIFID or, or MAR, the market abuse regulation, there is much more pressure on IR to um, you know, meet the needs of a much more varied investor base. So it's it's not only you know, you know your long only that you're engaging with, um, it's your passives, it's you know uh, different 
uh, different um, ESG focused funds, wh whatever it is. So it's much, much broader. And to be able to really engage effectively and in a targeted fashion, you need to have technology to support you. I mean, Thomas mentioned, you know, a much more optimized CRM tools. I think that's very critical. It needs to be the bread and butter now of every IR team, specifically the smaller ones that actually cannot no longer rely on the broker function to facilitate that access to investors. They need to be equipped with those kind of tools so they can actually engage with investors. And that's a, another aspect as well in terms of investor outreach is the globalized um aspect of that. So it's no, no longer the mega cap companies that should have, you know, engagement with US um, uh, investors, for instance, where the pockets are a lot deeper. So what worked for, for um, smaller and uh, mid cap companies is very important to um, increase that engagement and, and to put themselves on the map. And um, because of the absence of the broker support, uh, it becomes a job that IR needs to fulfill. Um, you'll find uh, uh, with a lot of the uh, bigger organization, they will have somebody who's now solely responsible for corporate access. Um, and, and that's something that, you know, is, is a trend that we're seeing, you know, outside of COVID, but I think it becomes a lot more heightened. Um, during the pandemic because you need to be a lot more organized and structured and targeted so you can actually use your time more efficiently. Specifically, when you think about the IR function, it's all about maximizing CEO and CFO time. You cannot waste their time, especially when they have to weather those kind of storms and think about you know, business uh, resilience and, and making sure that the business survives. So you need to make sure as an IRO that you have the right toolkit um, that can help you um, access to the right investors um, through targeting um, and uh, information about, um, you know, shareholdings and so on and so forth. So you can be more um, efficient. And that is something that, you know, I see out, that is really unrelated to COVID, but I think COVID has really sort of intensified um, the the workload and, and the requirements that IR actually has. No, that's definitely an excellent point. I mean, the world is definitely giving more and more importance to uh, multi-vertical platforms, if you would, you know, social media messaging, online shopping. Uh, and if you look at the financial world, studies are showing that one out of three Generation Z will actually rely on robots to make investment. So we're definitely going in that uh, direction. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, as a final question about life after COVID and some of these teams, teams that we've been discussing, such as stay at home, virtual connections could be longer uh, with us than initially planned, obviously. So what are some of the critical changes that we should take on? I know some of that you have already touched, but to further capitalize on the current disruptive environment, or in other words, if you were to give one single piece of advice to our investor relations audience, what would that be, please? Thomas, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, uh, it's not so easy to uh, to come up with one. Uh, I've been thinking a bit about it, and and it's one that I'm still thinking about. So I don't have the perfect answer. But I think as we may get a vaccine, right, uh, into 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 many people, it, the the world will open up gradually. But it won't open up like from zero to one. It won't go right. So it will be a gradual move. And I think in the beginning, and even after a, a while, it will be very important for our people to carefully consider where do they spend their travel time, where are they going, and to maximize the return from the traveling that they may be allowed to do. And, and I think we have to think a bit outside the box. I mean, it could even be that you go somewhere and a part of your activities are virtual still, but then you also do something physical, because there could even be different rules with different investors, do they allow people in? Do they not allow people in? It's not going to be, I think, one size fits all. And then there is the other dimension with what are you doing as an IR person and what is management doing? Because I, I would not be surprised if we're moving towards a world where IRs have to travel even more on their own and then management will attend uh, meetings through video. And you could even imagine that you could be at the investment firm and the management is on the video, but you sit there with the investor, right? Because you're on roadshow. Or it could be that you kind of take tier two, tier three investors with IR only, and then you offer video to tier one. Because I think there will be a difference in, in how we are going to do this. Zoom is very efficient or another virtual way of meeting. And I think the executives will choose that over being on an airplane, in a train, in a car. So I think this, this is a, this is something we need to carefully consider 
how do we optimize that, let's say, split between IR traveling, management traveling, and how much traveling in general? I'm not sure that I want to go back and travel as much as I did in the past. So, so that consideration about how to do it, how to do the outreach, prioritize, and prioritize IR versus management, I think is really critical. But I don't have a perfect answer. I'm still thinking about it. Well, we'll have hopefully many other venues to discuss more, but that has been excellent. Thank you. Mosse? Um, I guess the key point for me would be to improve your disclosure online in the post MIFID world, world and COVID world. And I would highlight again something that Marnie mentioned is, is ESG. Um, there are the companies that I look at in, in the emerging world. Um, they tend to have, uh, some of them don't have any ESG disclosure, but a lot of them I look at have very, very good ESG disclosure in their, in their financial statements. But some have, that gets missed by um, these information providers like Reuters, Bloomberg's, uh, MSCI's. So it's quite frustrating from us, for, for us to um, speak to the companies and tell them uh, to do this and they come back to us and they say that we're already doing it but, but they're not getting any credit for it they can, and they're getting penalized for not disclosing it properly so i guess the, the key message for me would be in the, in the in the in this new world it'd be a lot it'd be very beneficial for us if that information is available very easily on their websites and if companies can create these connectors with data providers and make sure that they have them as well that's so what that these companies are not penalized um, because ESG is a huge focus and many companies that we invest in are doing a lot of stuff, but unfortunately not using it in the right place. And that's, and that's quite important. And then the other thing I would say is that in for, for, for me, it's very, very beneficial if some of the KPIs that you provide in your annual statement, if there is a, a spreadsheet that, that is available and that discloses all your KPIs, there's one stop to go, we can go to and we can get all of that. And um, make, that would make our life a lot easier. So so the key message for me is improving disclosure online, both on the financial side and the ESG side. Very valuable. Thank you. And Amani? Um, for me, probably the one thing that I would um, uh, say to IROs is that they need to realize that they're competing for capital. Um, I think that's, you know, if, if you are acutely aware of that, then I think you, your behavior will change as a result. And um, if you think about, um, again, with MIFID in, 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 in place and Biosite having less access to research or choosing to have less access to research, you as an IRO, it is fundamentally up to you to position your company with the investor community and um, and I think that's that's really quite uh, quite important and and with that what I, what I said earlier as well to be a lot more clever around how you target investors the the investor um, uh, you know investment market is so fragmented so there is a lot more pockets to actually dip into for for IROs um, and if you think about buy side how many stocks they actually cover on average as far as we understand it's about 80 so if you if you think of that in in terms of global universe you're potentially competing with you know thousands of companies so how do you distinguish yourself um re re um view your capital market story your equity story what do you stand for why should investors you know invest in you be very clear about that message and um and package it obviously accordingly so um people understand it um what you're trying to achieve what your future looks like what your now looks like um and and i think that's very important and I think for 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 the future Mohsen mentioned I, I think the key word which is ESG it's not going to go away it's going to be more important ESG that ESG will be um, the absolute sort of focus area for the future because there won't be you know investors that don't have ESG as a filter so I think as part of the um, engagement with investors it is really up again to uh, uh, down to IR to understand what investors are looking for what their metrics are what their criteria are because it will be different from, from uh, investor to investor. But I think more importantly is that you as a company understand what your criteria are and that you have the skills and the ability and the knowledge to actually defend those criteria to your investors, make them understand why you focus on, on those areas and not on something else. Because I think what um, a lot of the rating agencies have been um, doing is somewhat distorting what is important and, and to a certain de degree potentially also misrepresenting some of those 
those companies with the ratings, um, which was you know very difficult uh, for for a lot of um, companies, and and they had to def defend them um, to to investors. So I think it's important that um, you know companies understand what they need to focus on and make that very um, make that very clear to the investor audience. Very true, very true. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, 45 minutes is never enough to discuss these uh, very valuable uh, insights you've been sharing, but we ran out of time. So I would like to thank uh, our audience for listening for uh, Tweed, obviously, for organizing this great annual summit uh, and the conference sponsors uh, for their support. But most importantly, to you guys, to all our panelists, for bringing your expertise, your experience around the table and engaging in such a fruitful conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you.